go. Hey guys, Xander here. Welcome back to Jaded Phoenix Movie Review Podcasts. Today we are joined again by Mandy. Hi! Uh, and, <laughs> and we will be discussing Love and Other Drugs, which is uh, a mutual favorite of ours. Seen it several times over and definitely recommend to watch. Um, so just some basic facts. Uh, the movie came out in 2010. So it is officially double digits now. That seems Has it been that long? both forever ago and <gasps> way too short a time ago. <laughs> uh, it was produced... Oh, God. Who produced this? We didn't exactly prepare for this one, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, because we've watched it so many times, we were both like, we got this. Nah, we, we, we probably uh, should have pulled up a few things. Oh, well. <laughs> we, yeah, I have, see, I have some of it up. The thing is, IMDb is not listing the production studio. Um... Is it on? Okay. It, it looks like it's Regency Films. Hmm, okay. Um, is it? I'm pretty sure that's that's what that R is. Well, as far as awards go. It got yeah. a couple of nominations at uh, Golden Globes for performances in a comedy. Uh, it's about the only big name. It did get a win with the Satellite Awards for Anne Hathaway, uh, Best Actress. Yep. So, good job, Anne. But, yeah, it, it, was, it kind of flew under the radar, um, which surprised me, considering it's... One, based on a, on at least a partially true story. And um, two, it deals with, you know, the, the rise of Pfizer and um, some of the, some of the struggles of chronic pain. So, and, chronic and, illness. Or well, just yeah. chronic illness, yeah. So... Uh, really surprised me that it, it flew so under the radar, but it was pretty late in 2010 that it was released, so that may be why. Yeah. Um, but our stars are Jake Gyllenhaal and Anne Hathaway. There's a whole bunch of other big names um, in in this movie. Like You've got Oliver Platt, Hank Azaria, Josh Gad, uh, Judy Greer. Um, so, you know, a good number of recognizable names. Yeah. It's got a good cast, uh, and of course the acting is just, it, it's so warm. I love how they did the acting in this. I really do. Mm -hmm. Like, Which mm -hmm. is why I'm surprised they didn't win more awards. But everything they did get noms for were acting. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's amazing. Uh, I think one of their noms was for Best um, Color Correction. But, um, which is part of what makes it feel so warm. Yeah. So it kind of goes hand in hand. The director was Edward Zick, or Zwick. Sorry, Edward, if I'm mispronouncing your, uh, your last name horribly. <laughs> um, and it was based off of the book by Jamie Wrighty. I didn't know it was based on a book. I love it. Uh, yeah, so um, the book is semi-autobiographical. Um, like, it basically, Jamie Randall is based off of Jamie uh, Wrighty. So um, Jake Gyllenhaal's character is very much based on a real person. And then there's no love interest in the um, autobiography because Jamie was afraid of his mother reading it, <laughs> oh. which I love. Um, but they did base Maggie, who is uh, Anne's character, off of 
uh, uh, Lucy Rusis, who is an actress um, who had early onset Parkinson's. And she's actually um, in the movie uh, as a speaker. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, so Jake spent a long time with Jamie just to try and, like, get prepped for his role. And Anne spent a lot of time with Lucy. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 So, a um, couple of other trivia things before we get into it. Uh, the um, At one point in the middle of filming, the director jumped into the bed with Anne and Jake uh, naked for a group shot, because they were already naked, and uh, they actually used that shot for the film's poster and just removed the director digitally. So that's that's really cool. Um, and if anyone wants to read the book, it's called Hard Sell, The Evolution of a Viagra Salesman. Um, I haven't read it, but um, I know the, the author was heavily involved in the production of this film. Um, and then... During an interview uh, with Vogue, Anne tried to explain the movie um, by saying, these are people who have no trouble taking their clothes off. In a way, their bodies are their currency, but they're terrified of exposing their vulnerability of becoming emotionally naked. Um, and I really like that the the two were distinctly separate from each other. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, it it really is they really are different. Yeah. Um, so you want to get a little bit into the story? Yeah, let's go for it. Cool. Um, so, starts off with, um, Jamie being, uh, you know, this hotshot salesman in a, uh, electronics store, early 90s electronics store. And starts off with the great uh, little soundtrack intro there, too. Yeah, yeah, it does. The, it, all of the, all of the music in this film, I like. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, Jamie is, like, hustling all over this electronic store he works in. Um, Flirting with the but, girls. Mm-hmm. Having sex with the girls in the fucking janitor's closet. You know. You know. Just doing whatever and clearly thinks that he's invincible. He gets so many sales, there's no way that they're going to fire him. And then they do. Yeah. And Jamie gets pulled into Pfizer, um, which at its start was basically a multi-level marketing scheme. Oh, yeah. Like, it was... Pfizer was definitely a pyramid when it started. Obviously, now it's a proper company, but not when it started. <laughs> no. Um, and so one of his friends was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm doing this. You'd be great at it. Um, and the thing that they're, you know, the thing that we're selling and pushing really hard right now is Viagra, which you love sex. So you're really going to be able to sell this. We'll just have a few sex parties and you'll sell all you need. So he started off on uh, Zoloft and Zithromax for the longest time. Yeah. Yeah, and he had he had a really hard time selling those. Yeah, because they're just harder to sell. Yeah, yeah. Um, Prozac. He was stealing people, like stealing doctors' offices samples and replacing them with his own. 
and then dumping the samples outside, made friends with a hobo because the hobo was like, hey, these are meds I need. So that was a cute little side storyline where he comes later and he's like, I've got a job interview. Can I get some more? Yeah, yeah. It, I really, I really enjoy that one. That was so um, cute. It was. And I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that happened. It probably does. Like, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so he, he gets involved in that. He and meets Maggie. Mm-hmm, Maggie catches him tossing some of the drugs and starts yelling at him for it, right? Well, she first saw him because he was shadowing that doctor uh, yeah. to learn a little bit more about the patients or something, and that was the first one he was in, was in on Maggie's doctor's appointment. And That's then she got right. pissed off because she took her top off and she, he was a drug salesman instead of a doctor. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And then she started taking his picture and yelling at him in the parking lot. Yeah, taking his picture with an old, uh, like, one of the original Polaroids. Oh, yeah. So, like, it's coming right out. It's great. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's just like, no, fuck this. Uh-uh, stop. Which he then gets her number from the nurse that he flirts with at one of the doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. And then calls her up and eventually gets her to agree to a date. Yep. Mostly so that he'll leave her alone if it doesn't go over well. Mm -hmm. And they end up having some really good talking and then some even better sex. Lots of sex. Like, basically, so their sex. relationship revolved around sex. Yeah. Like, it, you know, it's not, it's not a great way originally to, uh, to, to create a relationship, but you know what? For them, it worked. It worked out because she was, you know, the sick girl who didn't want to get attached to anybody, and he was the playboy who didn't want to get attached to anybody. And then they ended yeah. up accidentally falling for each other. Because they got to see each other mm -hmm. vulnerable. Exactly. And, you know, Maggie has early onset Parkinson's. And she's able to hide it for a while. Yeah. But the main way she hides it is if she's having a bad flare-up day, she, like, cancels on him, ghosts, whatever. Um, and then she comes back and she's just like, oh, yeah, sorry. And whatever. Yeah. But it finally gets to a point where she can't hide it anymore. Because he shows up with Chinese that one day, right? Mm-hmm. And she's having a yeah. bad day. Mm-hmm. And it's at that point that he really... I think that's the point that he realizes, oh shit, there's more to this than just sex for me. She is actually sick. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, that and, like, he has such a strong reaction to her being sick that he realizes he's already vulnerable with her. Mm-hmm. So she fights back for quite a while, you know, still trying to be just sex, no feelings. She tries to get him to leave her, leave her alone. She doesn't want to be dependent on him, doesn't want to drag him down. And they have a lot of trouble because of that. Yeah. But he finally convinces her, look, you need someone to go through this with. I want to go through it with you. Just let me stop being selfish. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes that this movie explores really accurately um, is the innate fear that chronic illness sufferers 
like Maggie, like both of us, um, go through, which is, you know, we, we will cling hard and strong to our autonomy and our independence and... And feeling independent and not reliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, our, our biggest fear is to be a burden because of our illness. Yeah. Uh, so, they, they're getting through that, um, and Jamie starts asking, you know, okay, is Pfizer doing anything for Parkinson's? Can we... You know, let me get into this. Can I start selling that? You know, what what can we do? Um, and doing all this research, and for the most part, hiding the amount of research he's doing from her, because he knows she won't approve. Yeah. So there's a lot of like montage where he's up late at night taking notes, browsing the internet. Um. And she's passed out, you know, beside him, or he's going to conferences that she doesn't know about, um, just trying to learn what he can do, what they can try, if there are any clinical trials, um, because he knows how difficult it makes things for her. And at this point, he's also starting to take her to all of these different doctor's appointments, like all mm -hmm. over the place. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really rough and they end up, um, there's a Pfizer conference and a Parkinson's conference in the same, like, is it the same convention center? Or it's, is it just like, like right across the street from each other or something, or they're like okay. within a couple of blocks yeah. of each other or something, but it, it's, yeah, it's Pfizer is holding close. their convention and then people with Parkinson's were holding their own convention to talk about what it is to ha like to live with Parkinson's and just talk to each other. And it's, it's such right. a sweet moment. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it also, it ends up terrifying the shit out of Maggie. Oh yeah. Cause she sees what it's like, like as this, it progresses and how hard it gets for people. Mm -hmm. And that's also the first time that Jamie hears from the one husband of what it's like to watch somebody live with it. And it, it mm -hmm. scares him. Yeah. And he's not backing out, even though he's scared, but she is. Yeah. She straight up ghosts him mm -hmm. because she cannot stand the idea of being a burden on this person she's come to care about. She thinks it will cause him less pain to end things now than to be the husband of one of those... Yeah, she wants him to have a life. Speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, so... He ends up finding out that she's about to take a bus up to Canada to get meds there because she can actually afford them up there and there's a wider array of options. Well, it's because she ran that like group where she would take the uh, bus full of senior citizens to Canada for them to get their cheap meds. Mm -hmm. And that's what she was doing is she was yeah. going on a trip and he knew she was going on the trip and he started chasing down the bus to talk to her. And be like, look, I want to be part of your life. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And he ends up actually getting ahead of the bus. So he's sitting in the parking lot where he knows that they'll, they'll stop. And he falls asleep waiting for her. Um, but ends up not missing her. And they have this just, like, absolutely heart-wrenching scene where they're both talking about 
you know, how scared they are and how, um, how this will affect, you know, both slash either of them. And God, that scene makes me sob every single time. Yeah. It's so well scripted, so well acted. It feels natural and organic. You can tell she also put a lot and... of effort into her emotional acting to like really mm -hmm. show that pain and that resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it ends up, you know, they're, they're together. They're happy. Everything is good. Um, we obviously know she has this long journey ahead of her, A hard but journey. neither of them are going it alone. Yeah. And she's finally able and willing to accept that she needs help and accept that that doesn't necessarily make her weak. Yeah. Um, so I've not been able to find any information on lighting, um, but the entire film was cast with very soft lights. So my guess would be that they used as much, um, not exactly natural lighting, but you know, things that would be on hand, so they may have, like, added lamps or, or whatever. But it's also possible that they used, um, you know, studio lighting. It just, it doesn't look like they used huge, huge lights. It looks natural in almost every single scene. Um, so that... That's part of what makes it nice and warm. Um, we already touched on, you know, sound. Um, Great music. James and, Nor uh, Howard Norton or whatever. He did the music for Hunger Games, too. Yep. Yep. And it... I didn't notice the Foley work, which is just about the best thing that you can say about Foley work. Yeah. Because um, you shouldn't be able to notice it. Um, and as we said before, it the colorist actually um, got nominated for best color in a, uh, I think it's an independent drama is what it was called. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so just all, all around great movie. It's in my top five. Um... Highly recommend anyone who's not watched it yet, go give it a watch. Um, be prepared for the tissues if you cry in movies and or if you are um, a chronic pain, chronic illness sufferer. I don't cry in a lot of movies, and as I said before, I sob every single time with this one. Yeah, I always cry at the end. Yeah. Uh, so what are your what are your closing thoughts I just love this movie I really do like not a lot of movies dive that deep into the emotional side of living with chronic illness yeah it, it, it's you might see living with chronic illness but it, it's not something that's at the forefront of a lot of like movies or TV shows. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, yeah. it's sweet to see what a relationship with somebody with chronic illness is like when you don't have chronic illness. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it, it's, it's nice to see it on a screen. Yeah. It, you know, there's there's a lot of, of talk these days about diversity and inclusion, and you know th this is one of those categories that rarely gets included, um, and generally when it does, it's you know some sort of gimmick. So for 
this movie to take it as see both nonchalant and serious are coming to mind which don't exactly like yeah it, i don't really it's know the a word. fact yeah it's it's a fact it's not a gimmick um and they take the truth of it seriously yeah like, so they're they very get really genuine. raw and emotional with it mm-hmm yeah um so you can find Jaded Phoenix Studios on our Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, or Instagram, um, or YouTube. You may be listening on YouTube already, but we have the audio-only versions on Patreon. And with the exception of Twitter, everything is just Jaded Phoenix Studios. Twitter is Jaded Phoenix STU. Um, I can be found sometimes, maybe, kind of, on Twitch, uh, username Zanby Quinn, and Instagram, same username. Uh, and then Mandy can also be found on Twitch and Twitter, Firefly325 or 3255 in the case of Twitter. So, as always, guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, definitely let us know what you think. If you have any movie recommendations, let us know that as well. We'd love if you subscribed. Um, but, uh, but really, we just want to get to know the, uh, the people who are watching. Yep. Cool. So you guys have a wonderful day. Bye.